Um, this is this is kind of my issue, so y'all y'all bear with me. You don't have to listen to any of this. Um, is there some placebo effect because people are just getting treatment, whether it be from the? That's a great question. Uh, there have been studies um, in the mental health, large mental health facilities that had large waiting lists, and they did uh, three month waiting lists, and they did research on the people who were on the three month waiting list, on the waiting list, never got in. They had an appointment. 33% got better, 33% 30 got worse, 33% stayed the same. So how do you figure that? Um, yeah, I think there's some placebo effect, but I think we can talk about that in in any specialty of medicine. Um, we're never going to say get your lazy self to the gym and stop taking your antidepressants. Okay, I'm not going to say that, but I am going to say. Uh, if you have to choose between seeing me and do an hour of yoga, go do the yoga. If you have to make that choice, and you have to choose one or the other, I vote for the yoga. Okay? We are so sedentary. Okay? Effective treatment for mild depression. Exercise. Remember the three chemicals? Endorphins is one, we call them endolphins, they swim all around everywhere. everywhere. Uh, exercise releases the endorphins. Exercise does what antidepressants do. Okay? Um, I think part of the treatment is good diagnosis psychiatrist if necessary, talk therapy, psychotherapy, uh, exercise, and food. Uh, we do not eat clean, okay? That affects our overall health, okay? And so this becomes a really, really important part of treatment for depressive disorder. Um, I'll never say it to you, okay? Um, I promise, but I do say it to people in the office. Uh, you don't deserve to feel good. <laughs> you are doing nothing. You are doing nothing that would enable you to feel good. Well, I resent that. Well, Okay. And so we have to ask ourselves, if we always feel bad, what are we doing to not feel bad? Well, there are a lot of people who aren't doing anything. And they expect to feel good. That's kind of strange. Psychiatrist, talk therapy, antidepressants, Exercise, food, uh, and again, people people really really do get better. Uh, but one of the things we know: the longer you wait to get treated, the longer it takes to get better. But the same thing is true for a sinus infection. If you wait two weeks to go see your doctor for a sinus infection, you're going to get 14 days of, a, of an antibiotic. If you wait two or three days, you're going to get seven days of an antibiotic. Well, there's a reason for that. The longer you let this be in your system, the longer you are sick, the longer it takes to get treatment, the longer it takes to get well. We have 15 minutes for questions. Susan. Um, you didn't mention um, electroshock or any 
those kind of things? Is that, is that something, treatments that you see a lot or not? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I consciously chose to just not do that. Um, what Susan's referring to is electroconvulsive therapy, uh, and, and it is a last resort for stubborn depressions that don't respond to any treatment, don't respond to four, five, six uh, different antidepressants over a significant period of time. Uh, we do ECT at Baptist, I think what Florida now does ECT, and basically you have uh, electrodes planted in a couple of places, and it is a brief shock uh, electroconvulsive therapy. And what it does, we think, is what the medicine does when it works. Uh, there are people who do very, very well with ECT. There are people who lose memory, uh, who lose their ability to find their way home. Uh, there, there's, there are people who take unilateral uh, ECT or bilateral ECT um, and uh, there are two or three psychiatrists in town who do a good job with this and you know, I'm always happy to be a triage kind of person. Good question. Jennifer? Um, so if we know someone that is struggling with depression and they have something I didn't include here and, and should have. Uh, let me answer let me answer my question first and maybe it's yours. Um, someone goes through treatment, they're on medicine nine to twelve months, they do well, they come off the medicine, they're doing fine. A year later they have a reoccurrence of depression. Okay. Uh, we can go ahead and guess that we we start the treatment back, we do the treatment again. I forget the numbers, but there's like a 50% chance there's going to be a third event. And if there's a third event, there's a 80% chance there's going to be a fourth event. Okay? So at some point, at some point, what we have to say to people is, this medicine is going to be part of your food plan for the rest of your life. And this is what you're going to have to do. And so our psychiatrist, uh, I bumped into a lady at the office this morning who sees a psychiatrist once a year. And she gets her refills for the year and she's doing great. But she went through this three or four times with reoccurrences, okay? Now, if you're, if you're talking about someone who is still in that first nine to 12 months and they're six months into it and they've done well and all of a sudden, well, something's happened in their life that they need to pay, take a look at, pay attention to, or sometimes brain chemistry changes and somebody needs to be changed from one medicine to another or the medicine their own needs to be increased. Okay, and this is why I prefer psychiatrists, okay? When, when my knee went out, I did not call an ophthalmologist. Okay, I called an orthopedist, okay? And, and because that's what they do, okay? And so I prefer psychiatrists and they're really good psychiatrists in town because someone who is in the middle of treatment and doing well and tends to slide back down, there could be several reasons for that. Another life event, another trauma, the medicines could be um, not doing what they're supposed to do. There could be a need for increase in, in the dosage. Um, a person could have started using alcohol heavily. Um, the person could have gone to another physician and started another medicine for another medical issue and the medicines don't work together. So there, there are just all sorts of things. What I would do is encourage the person to get back to the caregivers 
and, and let's crank this thing up and see what's going on. Is that kind of what you're asking? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Mary? What place would you give our group work in this process? Um, I love group work. It is a management headache trying to get in this world, trying to get six or seven people in the same place at the same time they're doing the same thing. Um, the, the, the genius of group work is seen in AA. And, and as, as Fred as Fred Beekner once said, if you want to if you want to see what church is supposed to be like, go to an AA meeting. Okay. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, if we can put that I don't I don't have any groups going right now because there's such a management issue, okay. But to have six or seven people who are clinically depressed uh, that's a powerful experience if they're in there and open and working, okay? So it's a good question. Let me point you to one resource and you'll be proud to know who wrote the book. Uh, I loaned my copy and I couldn't, I don't know who I gave it to. Uh, there is a book titled Jesus Wept. And I really wish every one of you would go on Amazon and buy it. It is written by uh, Barbara Brown, uh, Barbara Crafton. Barbara is, she's been here, some of you may know who she is. Uh, Barbara is a kind of retired Episcopal priest. Uh, she herself has a stubborn, stubborn uh, depressive disorder that has come and gone for years and years and years. And she wrote this book, in fact Mary introduced me to, to Barbara's work, uh, The Sewing The Sewing Room, yeah. Uh, had Barbara here for a clergy conference uh, when you were suffering for Jesus in Hawaii, I think. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I remember. Yeah. Nobody's depressed out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, and it is a great book. What it is is what she calls an ask book. She has a number of people who read her daily uh, devotions, and uh, and so she she asks people to write about their. Uh, experiences with depression and their loving family members and caregivers to write about depression. And uh, she compiled this book, Jesus Wept, uh, for his passage in the Bible, uh, Barbara Crafton. Uh, I, I, it would be a great book for you to use in a study group. Uh, it would be a great book to read. Uh, I have probably referred hundred people to that book. It is phenomenal. Uh, and so that would be a good book to read. Yes? Do you think we need to reevaluate some of the mass discharges, discharges from the uh, uh, mental hospital? Because we have many people on the street that are not being treated that are really sick. Um, yeah, that's a great question and that gets into public policy and insurance companies and um, um, a lot of it had to do with coming about beginning with methylbam and going forward. Yeah, I'll tell you an interesting piece of history in Americana. Uh, 19, uh, 1966 uh, 1966 was the year that I think the 66 was the year that lithium was uh, came on the market. Lithium was for many years the uh, primary treatment for bipolar disorder, but used to call manic depression bipolar disorder, 1966. 1966 was also the first year in this country there were more discharges from state mental hospitals than admissions. Which is phenomenal. Because they started using this medicine for all the bipolar patients who got better, got stabilized, and got home. But we do have a we we have a population that is not served because of all the reasons we talked about, uh, because of funding. Uh, and some don't want to be served, and, and some don't want to be served. Uh, absolutely, uh, but there are some people who don't want treatment for their cancer either. So. Mm -hmm. 
Question. Um, after hearing your story about the doctor, how do you go about finding someone good? Oh. Uh, I mean, what's that process? Not the yellow pages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk with your primary care physician. You talk with your pastor. You talk with friends and neighbors. Uh, and, and I also would say that um, a first visit, I think a first visit with any physician, any mental health, any, any health care provider, first visit uh, is, is a mutual consultation. I mean, I have the right to say, you know, I just don't think we're a good fit. Okay. You have the right to say, this, I just this doesn't feel right, okay? And a lot of people think that there's something wrong with them or you know, something funky is going on with them and so they need to keep trudging away and it's not a good fit. I mean, this is a whole different process than an internal medicine guy taking blood saying, here's blood work. You know, that's different from somebody sitting down and talking about really personal intimate issues, okay? I think the church is a place to go. Uh, I think the primary care physician is a place to go. Good question. Yes, John. I just wanted to say briefly, um, some of you may want to know what antidepressants feel like. And I'll tell you firsthand, I've been on antidepressants for many years, and I sure thought that you too. I didn't want to have anything to do with them. I quit a couple of times, suffered for it, and, um, and I've also had the doses clean. But I just want you to know my experience with antidepressants is, uh, I believe in them so far, uh, it's that they do their work quietly. You don't feel a buzz or a high. You just begin to feel better again. And it does take a while. You have to be patient. But um, uh, it makes me feel what I like to call normal. <laughs> We need more people like John French to say what he just said. Um, well, Bless you. Yes. I'll concur. I've picked you the same thing. I've dealt with it for 13, 14 years. Yeah. I've come from my family that was alcoholic, so they probably even put that in there. Yeah. True. Um, yeah. Um, every every diabetic knows what it feels like to be diabetic, and knows what it feels like to get regulated on insulin or metformin or, or whatever. And what you, what the diabetic says is, wow, it feels so good to be normal. It feels so good to feel normal again. Uh, and we all understand that. But it's, it's hard for some of us to understand what John said, but it's the same thing. Okay, it's the same thing. Because a part of your body is not working. It's not normal. 
and now it's normal, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay. Um, what we're going to see next week um, is that is that depression is a huge component uh, in suicidal behavior, uh, and so many people who attempt and complete suicides are clinically depressed. Okay. So I think the conversations do start here, and uh, I, uh, I appreciate your attention. I appreciate the wonderful questions. I appreciate the hospitality of Susan and St. Christopher's, and um, hope to see you um, next week. Grace and peace. Thank you. Thank you.